adventure. It runs in our blood. It's just part of being human. On the path of adventure, many times we find treasures. Some treasures are tangible. You can hold them in your hand. Other treasures are just memorable. You keep them in your head and you keep them forever. It's like telling stories about the good old days. Money comes and goes. Treasures last forever. The best memories are shared with friends. And I will tell a story to the best of my memory about a group of friends who made a once in a lifetime discovery of an ancient Indian dugout canoe dated to be 1500 years old and later exhibited at the Matheson Museum in Gainesville, Florida. At an early age, John and I found common interest in animals and wildlife. That initial common interest is what eventually led us to discovering this ancient Indian canoe. We'd spend hours in creeks with our backpacks and habitrail aquariums in search of reptiles and amphibians we could bring home and show our families. At one point, we told ourselves we'd catch every species of snake, and we decided to start cataloging each one. Well, catching them was easy, but cataloging them and showing them later on proved to be more difficult when the old desktop computer crashed. Spending so much time in creeks, we began to find fossils and shark teeth. Shark teeth were interesting to us. It was like a lost, extinct creature that only the tooth could tell the story of. Mostly small shark teeth to start with and eventually finding a few big ones here and there. Usually not more than one or two per trip of decent size. But over many years of many trips, we started to build quite extravagant collections of shark teeth. And we started finding ways to showcase them. We found that shark teeth and our plaques of shark teeth were a lot more easy to show people. And people had a more interest in that too. We continue to wonder what more is there. And that's when we found out about Native American artifacts. Oh yeah, there's definitely pottery. And that's when we set off on another expedition into the unknown to find Native American artifacts. It was hard at first to distinguish between a regular old piece of flint and something finely chiseled by a Native American thousands of years ago. But after you find your first piece, there's no mistaking the difference. My first piece was this pendant right here. From that point on, we were hooked. It seemed as though all we thought about and talked about or did was something related to Native American artifacts. Where to find them, where we found them, what they look like, possibly what time period they're from, what tribe created it, what's the stem and the base look like. There's so many different types of Native American artifacts, it seemed as though we'd never find them all. But after many years of continual searches and hunting Native American artifacts, we got quite good at it. And it seemed as though our collections were growing exponentially. We'd bring our artifacts to work for show and tell. It seemed as though each piece was complementing the next and leading up to the next big find. Every so often you'd find a piece that reminds you of something else you found. But this is what really brings me back to the canoe. I mean, this is a piece of driftwood I found. And just the way it looks, it looks like it was freaking worked. It looks chiseled like there's so much work done to it almost. It's like, was it a canoe? I don't really know, but it's things like this that always bring me back to why I'm writing my book, why I'm making this movie. It's really not about the credit as much as it's about just the experience and having something to look back on and show your friends, because just describing it sometimes is a lot harder to express how much it actually means. I mean, look how flat that is on one side there. No way they weren't trying to make something out of that. I mean, it's truly amazing 
1492 Columbus saw the ocean blue and Europe had no idea this place even existed and when I go looking for artifacts and stuff I uh, I pull these things out of the ground and 1492 was like yesterday compared to when these things were lost I mean look at that hammerstone there you know Over 10,000 years ago, the first ancestors of Native Americans migrated south via the Bering Strait from Asia to the Americas, slowly moving southward towards central Florida. Most tribes in central Florida are dubbed the Timucan Indian tribes, and one such colony is known as the Cades Pond People. The Cades Pond People stuck their claim here in north central Florida. And lived here from thousands of years ago up until around 500s. When one pond here mysteriously dried up, we decided to take a hike and see if there was anything we could discover. Maybe to find some sign of colonization. This is just some list of stuff. So the lake was rather unusual. The soil was almost like that of another planet. Very rich soil, however, also very dry. No vegetation grew in this arid environment. There was even debate as to whether this was a man-made lake or a natural formation. There was a peculiar spot in the lake that seemed lower than the rest, and there was a lot of driftwood there. We wondered if this was perhaps where a sink formed and perhaps drained the lake at one point. The lake hadn't been dry for long. Most of the pieces of wood were still intact. After hiking the entire dried lake bed, with no sign of flint or Native American artifacts, we began to wonder, is this a natural formation or a man-made lake? Upon analyzing the soil, realizing the richness, we determined it was a natural formation. Perhaps there just wasn't any colonization. When suddenly John spotted an unusual piece of wood buried beneath the soil. Our immediate assumptions was a dugout canoe, or at least our hopes were. We began some minor excavations to finally reveal sidewalls. At this point we were certain we'd found an ancient Indian dugout canoe. So we took extra caution in excavating this once in a lifetime discovery. Using our bare hands and some hand tools. Even finding a small plank of wood inside the hull of the canoe, wondering, is this a paddle, an oar, a seat? Realizing this was the biggest find of our lifetimes, a once-in-a-lifetime discovery, and all the right factors took place. The pond dry enough to explore it, and the soil wet enough to preserve it. Would you consider it a lucky find or just the sheer determination of a group of friends to discover new and interesting things? Well, probably a little bit of both, I'd say. Excavating a 16 and a half foot long dugout canoe with our bare hands and some small hand tools, that was a good day's work. Little did we know that was only the beginning of the work. We headed home, still very excited about our discovery. We showed the pictures to our family and some close friends. Word traveled fast. Soon people we'd never met were contacting us about this canoe. We didn't feel comfortable bringing people we'd never met out to the site. The following weekend, John, John's wife Liz, and I all headed back out to the site where the canoe was discovered. Ready to take more photos to show our family and friends. Wondering how the canoe got there, and why it was left behind. This log here was submerged in the water, and because of being submerged in the water, it, it kind of protects its life. As long as oxygen is not getting to the wood, it will preserve itself a lot longer in time than, let's say, if it was just sitting on the land. 1,500 years to be specific. Water acts as a preserving agent for wooden artifacts. By uncovering the canoe, 
we had exposed the canoe to more air. More air meant the canoe would dry out faster, which would cause cracks. The effects of drying out were already present. The race was on. We had to hoist the canoe onto a trailer utilizing a tractor until further team members could arrive to remove the canoe from a trailer onto a wooden platform. On the wooden platform, it was easier to work on it. We then vacuumed all the debris and soaked it with a hose. At this point, we measured the canoe. It was 16 and a half feet long. By thoroughly soaking the canoe, we reduced the rate of deterioration. We then covered it with a tarp to reduce the rate of evaporation. At this point, we hit a dead end. With the state of the canoe in limbo, and nothing further we could do to preserve it, we decided to search the lake again. We hiked around the lake and settled for an area on a ridge. We assumed the water level must have been around that area and would have seen the most activity around the time of the Native American colonization. After many hours of searching with no signs of Indian artifacts, we weren't sure we were going to find anything. Then suddenly John found something. At the lake, we hit something. Looking like some sort of tooth or something. Dang. Yeah. I never Wash found it off. <laughs> Dang, there's a hole in it. Must be a pendant or something. Ceremonial. And not just any ordinary pendant. This pendant must have been very old, around the time of the canoe. The finding of this shark tooth marked the end of our day and capped off all further searches on the lake. We never went back to the lake Sometimes, to search again. When you really want to find something or do something, you gotta go places where nobody's willing to go. It's the only way you're gonna get where you wanna be in life. If it was easy, everybody would do it. That's why I made time to do this and went out of my way to do it. Because I already knew it was gonna be hard if I didn't make time, it wasn't going to make itself. I had to make it. We lost touch with the canoe after that and the place where we found it. Me, Mike, and John all continued our expeditions, seeking wildlife and adventure. Responsibility and the call of life draws you away from your old oh. pastimes and hobbies. And you're forced to squeeze them in where they fit. Some treasures are tangible, you can hold them in your hand. Other treasures are just memorable. Nearly a year passed with no word on the canoe. It seemed to be a fading memory. Every so often you find a piece that reminds you of something else you found. Unsure about the state of the canoe, Pretty with cool the threat of words. complete deterioration. Reminds me of the Indian canoe we found. Man, it's all there. That almost could have been a canoe or something back in the day. The canoe lives on in more ways than just our memory. Little hints were everywhere. Then we got news on the canoe. The Matheson Museum had acquired it, and it was undergoing the long process of preservation. A dream come true. The canoe was being preserved and put on display for the whole world to see. To someday bring our kids and grandkids to go and look at it and tell the stories of how we found it. The preservation process can take as long as a year. We were in a state of uncertainty with no resolution as to the outcome of the canoe. We were in limbo, waiting on the state of the canoe again. It took a lot of effort and time for a tribe of Native Americans to carve out a dugout canoe utilizing fire and stone tools. It wasn't just a disposable item. We wondered how the museum would tell the story of the canoe. Would they start sometime thousands of years ago? A colony that relied heavily on Florida's plentiful waterways for fishing and navigation. A story of some fishermen who went out on the lake to catch food for their families when the canoe took on water and sunk to the bottom of the lake.
only to be covered up with silt and preserved for another 1500 years. By understanding the effort it took Native Americans thousands of years ago to create a dugout canoe and the effort to move a canoe from land to water without ever having invented the wheel, we can comprehend the everyday struggle Native Americans face for survival. Native Americans were resourceful people. They were very in tune with nature. They only took what they needed from the land because they realized they needed the land more than the land needed them. Like the saying, a dog is a good judge of character. I believe this to be true with all wildlife. Animals use their resources to the best of their ability. Animals can even show compassion. Take this article in Cedar Key Times. Two kayakers capsize their canoe off of the big dock at Cedar Key. When one kayaker thinks his friend kicks him, he realizes a dolphin had bumped him to the surface. Several more months had gone by without hearing anything about the canoe. When we finally spoke to a builder who was working on an exhibit for the canoe at the Matheson Museum, he told us the carbon dating had come back and that the canoe was dated to be 1,470 years old. Still curious how the museum would present the story of the canoe. We already knew a few pieces of the story would get lost in translation. We knew that these pictures of us sitting in the canoe wouldn't make it all the way to the museum. The canoe was a learning experience for all of us. We had never dealt with an artifact of this nature, so we somewhat regret sitting in the canoe now, realizing just how fragile it really was. We're grateful we got the opportunity to. Right here. This picture right here? Here. At last, May 7, 2014, an article was published in My Flourish magazine detailing the discovery of the canoe and the release of the exhibit in the Matheson Museum. A whole three years had passed since 2011 when we discovered the canoe. Our worst fears came true. Details were lost in translation. Key details, like our names, Jonathan Kelso, Alex Dobosevich, and Michael Burley. We didn't take it to heart. We figured it was just a fluke in this one article, a detail the author had mistakenly forgot. And most certainly a museum with the premise of preserving history wouldn't forget such details. Only one name was mentioned. It was the person we entrusted with the well-being of the canoe. January 16th, 2015. The Gainesville Sun publishes an article inviting people to come and check out the new exhibit about the Timucan Indian tribes, with the main attraction being our canoe. Once again, no mention of our names. That just didn't seem to be the purpose of this article anyhow. January 25th, 2015, nine days later, WCJB TV 20 News draws more people to the exhibit. The Matheson History Museum celebrated the opening of a new exhibit aimed to explore Alachua's native heritage. Museum attendees learned about the native people's day-to-day -day living and enjoyed a mural painted by a local artist depicting what life could have looked like a thousand years ago. For the main attraction, people had the chance to examine an almost fully intact canoe recovered in 2011. The canoe was found in a pond in northern Florida. Testing revealed the canoe was 1,470 years old. The Timucan exhibition is now a permanent part of the museum. It had now been four years since the discovery of the canoe, and it seemed like it was finally coming around, getting some recognition. It was a great feeling. We live our life by bringing other people into our adventures and sharing our stories with them. I found it this deep in the dirt on a dry, on a lake bed. Al, Al was there. I found this. Yeah, yeah, I got proof. So I found my first artifact. You know what I mean? Kind of excited. You know what I mean? Don't get to, not many people get to find these. Um, I was out there in the creek and I actually seen like that sticking up out the dirt. And I was like, ooh, it looks like a tooth. And it actually was, man. I'm like pretty stoked I found my first artifact.
Treasure is something somebody lost, left behind, or stored for later, and was never returned to until a later date when its value had increased. The sad thing about it is, is all the trash that people just throw into nature. I mean, look at it. You'd think we were in a third world country or something. All the trash they have piled up in here. I mean, we're in a beautiful, natured part that nobody ever gets to see. And all you see is years and years of trash. I mean, we... 1,000 years from now, tires will go extinct. Tires are created from rubber, and rubber is created from trees. Trees that were underappreciated and overharvested. Now go 500 years from that, and a group of four people find a pile of rubble. When one person spots a tire, suddenly the pile of rubble has value, and the tires are treasure. The day we discover the canoe, a lake riddled with wooden debris. Only a small fragment of the canoe exposed. It took a keen eye to be able to determine the fragment of wood was worth further investigation. I hadn't seriously searched for Native American artifacts for about a year. I primarily focused on finishing a big plaque of fossils and shark teeth. One day while looking for shark teeth and fossils, I stumbled across an Indian artifact. A hammerstone. So translucent in color, I almost mistook it for a crystal. I hurried back to show my friends what I had found. We got to talking about all the cool and unique things we discovered, and it seemed as though everything led back to the canoe. We had already told hundreds of people our story. At a tree conference, I had the privilege of talking to the curator of the Matheson Museum telling her our story, and she took interest in it. I exchanged emails with her, and I started typing an email detailing the discovery. I worked on it for several days. Then before I completed it, I lost all my work and her contact information. John was fortunate enough to make it to the grand opening of the Matheson Museum's new exhibit, and even spoke to the Gainesville Sun and gave them a testimony. Despite all our efforts, we couldn't seem to get any solid results. I got a degree in history at Santa Fe College, and one thing about history is the victors tell the story. We felt like we were standing on the other side of some barrier. The war was not over. This hammerstone triggered something in me to take matters into my own hands. I started searching intensively online for any information about the canoe. I found five links to the canoe, none with any mention of John, Mike, or my name. The only article I found with my name and the keyword canoe was in the Cedar Key Times when we capsized our canoe off the big dock at Cedar Key. There was no mention in the Gainesville Sun of John's testimony or anywhere else. It was at this point I realized if I wanted to get our story out there, I had to do it myself. First, I logged on to Wikipedia. I found the Matheson Museum's website. I clicked on the link to the canoe, and I realized there weren't any details to the canoe, so I told our story. That same day, the author deleted my work. I tried three times. Finally, I got a reply from the author. He said he'd never heard that story before. And that that wasn't the story he read in My Flourish magazine. I tried to tell him our story. I even offered him some pictures and sent him a friend request on Facebook, all to which he declined. He then contacted the builder of the exhibit at the Matheson Museum. The builder said the story sounded familiar and our name sounded familiar as if he didn't know him. The author saw the value in the details I'd posted on their webpage, and he let me keep them. Finally, a small victory. I contacted My Flourish magazine. I told them our story. 
even offered them some photos from the day we discovered the canoe, photos that have never been released to the public. I gave them my email and my phone number and waited a few days, but no reply. I wanted the photos of the day we discovered the canoe to be out there to the public, so I logged on Facebook. I took some advice from a friend and I decided to give the canoe its own page. I wanted to get the photos out to the public and try to tell the whole story. I realized telling the whole story would be more difficult. I'd have to write it down first. What I thought would be a few short pages turned into a 50 page book. I then started typing the pages onto my old laptop computer. But at about 10 pages in, my computer wouldn't let me run that program anymore. I could see my work, I just couldn't do anything with it. Several months went by and New Year's came around. My New Year's resolution was to put the book to the side and get the photos out there to the public. That's when I decided to start making this movie. I had so many old photos and videos, I realized it was only a matter of time before I lost them. I had to get the video done. I hadn't been back to Trout Pond since the day we discovered that shark tooth, and I still hadn't seen the exhibit at the Matheson Museum. Two things on my bucket list that I had to do for this video. following Saturday I had a job to do, but I couldn't start it till later in the day. I realized this would be the perfect opportunity for me to head back out to the lake. Getting back to the lake was a little tricky. I had to take roads I wasn't familiar with, some dirt roads that looked more like driveways, and a hike through the woods just to get back to the place where we discovered the canoe. This is the easiest part of the trail right here. On arriving at the lake. Right through some random church that's got in session and all this. It appeared to have completely overgrown. High weeds. As I approached the weeds, I found a low area. An area that looked like it had dried up not too long ago. And a layer of grass on top of that. But just below that layer of grass, I realized the lake was much the same as the day we discovered the canoe. This is just some of the richest Still black just this you'll ever see. unusual black soil, yeah. almost like that of another planet. At last, I finally set eyes on the area where we originally discovered the canoe. In that area, the lake hadn't changed a bit. There was no vegetation, just black chunks of soil. I didn't anticipate finding any Indian artifacts, and I didn't, but I did want to bring something home with me. So I took a large chunk of this black soil home with me to show John and anybody else who was interested. There's thousands of reasons not to do something. Tell you what though, you really only need one reason to do something. Yeah, this was a little out of my way. This wasn't the path of least resistance. I'm way out of my way to Alright, we got the sample. Core sample. Whoa! So excited. So, dude. It's yeah. like Whether John's expression was real or not, I could see the excitement in his eyes. Being able to see that soil that we pulled that canoe out of six years prior, it just brought back old memories. After what seemed like a lifetime, we finally got the opportunity to go back to the museum. Finally, at long last, we uh, made it up here to the archives and museum. Kansas World and Life Tour Max the Museum. We're going to walk in and see what they got for us. The door was locked. My heart dropped. I thought, no, another obstacle into telling our story. <laughs> um, apparently, the door is locked. Right. How you yeah, doing? The was there. We are worried that y'all were closed today. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. What's the new exhibit going to be on? Um, the last one was on like uh, the springs and how they healed your body with water and historic stuff about that. And now we're moving towards, um, I haven't really told much about it, but I can't think of it off the top of my head, but it's, it's going to be something big. Oh, 
Oh, is it a secret? <laughs> a secret. Okay, all right, all right, we understand. What's the story on the canoe? Um, well, back in, I think it was 2010, uh, it was discovered at a, a little creek, um, not too far, like, out of Gainesville, still in the last row, though. Yeah, that's cool. And, uh, so it was dug up, and it took about a year to be restored, and, uh, after some debate, um, we were allowed to keep it here. Oh, oh really? What was the debate about? Um, well, the National Museum of History wanted it, so, um, then after a little bit of just talking about it, we got it because, you know, they're really big, so we just negotiated and we got it. Yeah. Yeah. Do they have their own canoes there? Uh, I'm sure they probably got tons of stuff. Yeah, they? yeah they probably do. They're, they're really big. Yeah. I was just wondering what those people. I'm actually going to sound Oh, you were? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say it's Wow. Yeah. I was wondering the story I told everybody, you know what I mean? How was, uh, Is that somewhat accurate? Yeah, yeah. Alright. Um, At that moment, my camera phone glitched and John's story got cut off. Essentially, we told the volunteer that we were two of the four original discoverers of the canoe. And we were just interested to see what story they were telling everybody. There was only one one second video of the day we discovered the canoe when I accidentally took a video instead of a picture. We then asked the volunteer if he could just take a picture for us so we'd have something to show people. Do you know who did the preservation of it? Um, I'm not too sure. The story hadn't really been released to the public, at least not in its entirety. My goal was to get the full story out there to the public, get the photos out there before something bad happened to my computer or my phone again, and essentially give credit where credit was due. As always, thanks for watching my channel, my video, God bless. Oh, and don't forget to press that subscribe button just below.